Professor Jones earned his BA and MA in German here from BYU, and afterwards a PhD in linguistics from Princeton University. He joined the BYU faculty in 1978 after stints with the CIA as the director of their language proficiency testing and as an assistant professor of linguistics in German at Cornell University. Since coming to the university, he has served as a, in a wide variety of professional and university capacities, including a stint as the dean of the College of Humanities, where he was very uh, directly concerned in the Kennedy Center and with our programs and was a great support and has been a good friend to the center. We're pleased to welcome him back today, uh, speaking to the topic of multilingualism in Switzerland, what does it really mean? So please join me in welcome Professor Randy Jones. Thank you, Jeff. I also appreciate the support of the Kennedy Center in my research. Uh, they've been a very good friend of mine as well as my being a good friend of theirs. I spoke to some students yesterday during a luncheon of the uh, Presidential Scholarship students, and I talked to one of them who was taking class in public speaking. And I said to him, I assume that in public speaking now, there's a lot of emphasis on using PowerPoint in speaking. Is that correct? And he said, no. They told us not to use PowerPoint because too often it doesn't work. And so uh, we're going to hope we're going to we're going to hope to uh, change that today. Uh, last winter semester, I gave a talk here at the center, and I used uh, overhead transparencies. They worked just fine, but that's called low tech, and I thought we'd advance into high tech for today's PowerPoint presentation. So what we may have to do is have a vivid imagination, and I'll explain to you what the uh, various transparencies are, the various slides are, and you can just kind of uh, picture that. How are we doing, guys? Uh, any hope? Well, just, just keep on trying. Maybe we'll get the last one on there. Switzerland is a relatively small country located in the center of Western Europe and surrounded by Germany to the north, France to the west, Italy to the south, and Austria to the east. You have a good imagination there, I'm sure. It's known to most Americans for a number of things. And the picture here shows uh, cheese and the Matterhorn and uh, lakes and so forth, Swiss chocolate. It's mainly known for its pristine alpine beauty, but also for its strong independence. Switzerland, for example, is not a member of the European Union, nor NATO. And they have tend to avoid a lot of the uh, alliances that other European countries have been involved with. And until recently, had very strict immigration laws. That has changed, however, in the past few years. Although I'd love to talk about chocolate and cheese and even trains and clocks, my talk today will be about multilingualism, because it's fairly well known by most people that there are several languages that are used in Switzerland today. The meaning of the word multilingualism seems to be quite self-evident, but it also invites a great deal of misunderstanding. Oh, we got a light at least, anyway. So we're making progress, it looks. In a country such as Switzerland, the situation of how the languages fit together is not always self-evident as it may seem. Exactly where are the languages spoken in Switzerland? How many speakers are there of each one? How do they get along with each other? Is the French, German, and Italian spoken in Switzerland the same as the French, German, and Italian spoken in Germany, France, and Italy? And what is Romanche? Do the Swiss speak all of these languages? I will address these and other questions and hope to give an accurate and interesting glimpse of the wonderful linguistic world of this beautiful country. I'm curious, how many here, if anybody, are from Switzerland? Anybody? Okay, we got one. How many here have been in Switzerland, served missions, or lived there for what other reason? Switzerland is divided into 26 states, or as they call them, cantons, I'll say canton. Uh, not to be confused with the area of China. And if you saw the map here, you'd see all these 26 in different colors here. In the west, there are French-speaking cantons of Geneva, Vaux, Neuchâtel, and Jura. And pardon my, Swiss, uh, my uh, French pronunciation. The Italian-speaking of canton of Ticino is in the very far south here. And all of the German-speaking cantons except for Ban are all monolingual cantons. In the cantons of Bern, Fribourg, and Valais, both French and German are spoken and recognized as official languages. However, however German is by far the majority, of la the majority language in the canton of Bern, 
and French has a majority in Fribourg and a slight majority in Valais. The only significant population of Romance speakers is in Graubünden, which is in the far east of the country. It's the largest canton and the least populated of the cantons. There are also two pockets of Italian speakers here, but the majority and the official language in Graubünden is German. And if you saw the Graubünden map over here, you see down at the very su south end, two little thumbs that stick out, both of which are Italian population. There are only two cities in Switzerland that are really considered bilingual, Biel and Fribourg. Uh, I want to say Fribourg because it was, it's called that in German. Biel is in the canton of Bern, and Fribourg, not surprisingly, is in the canton of Fribourg or Fribourg. Biel is truly bilingual. And now I show my slides that show the various bilingual signs and everything on the, on the uh, screen here. On the streets and the shops and the railway station, one hears both French and German. When one walks into a shop, the clerk will greet you in either French or German, usually his or her native language. And if we respond in the other language, then they will switch to that. But this language switching is generally not necessary for the locals because most of them are functionally bilingual. It is also not uncommon, I'm told, for a conversation to take place in both languages. That is, one speaks French and one speaks German. The LDS ward in Biel used to be bilingual, but now there are two wards, a German ward and a French ward that meet at different times in the same building. In the city of Puyborg, which used to be predominantly German speaking, it's also bilingual, but in a slightly different sense. The university there is very proud of its bilingual uh, curriculum. In fact, if you look it up on the web page, everything's in both French and German. You can actually have a choice of one or the other, but everything else is generally in both languages. I have a street sign here, also a free book that shows uh, the name of the street in both French and German. But as it turns out, in the more modern section of the city, the language is generally French. In fact, you'll find a lot of areas that are simply not bilingual. All the signs are in French, and most of the conversations that you hear take place in French. It's primarily in the lower part of the city, down by the cathedral and by where the river runs, that most of the German speakers live. As it turns out, over the years, uh, it's gone from a French, uh, primarily a German-speaking city to primarily a French-speaking city. What is the ratio of speakers of each language in Switzerland? And if you look at the slide up here, you can see uh, it depends upon, number one, if you consider all residents or just the citizens of Switzerland. It also depends on which poll one selects. The graph that you're looking at is based on the 1990 census and includes foreign residents as well as the citizens. As you can see, it says here in my notes, German represents 63.7% of all the residents of uh, Switzerland, or about two-thirds. French is 19.2%, or about one-fifth. Italian is 7.6%, and Romanche is 0.6%. So you see here a wide discrepancy in the population in terms of the language they use. German by far the predominant language. And if you were able to see the map here, you'd see that most of the colored area for German, that is, it takes up most of the map. French on the west, Italian down in the south, and then Romanche only in certain pockets in the far east in the area of Graubünden. Now, one category is 9%, and that's other languages. And that may be quite surprising that of the residents of Switzerland, about 9% of them speak a language other than the four national languages. Now, I might point out here that we need to make a differentiation between a national language and an official language. There are four national languages in Switzerland, the ones I just named, but only French, German, and Italian are considered official languages. That is, Romanche, even in the canton of Graubünden, is not an official language. It's used but it doesn't have the same status as German or even Italian. To gain a better understanding of the multilingual nature of Switzerland, it's helpful to have a look at this, its history. And now I have a, oh my goodness, look at this. We'll take a slight pause for applause here. Can you? Oh, not for me, not for me, it's for them, we're getting the applause. I, can you clarify it just a bit?
Okay, now go to the... Uh, no, just cancel that and go to File and Open. And then, uh, oh dear, go, go to C and then to AA Files, Present, and then that's it. No, <laughs> PP Slides. Oh, my goodness, look at this. Okay, go down and, and click on that. Right down here. Right there. Yeah, the slideshow. It's not going. Oh, yeah, tell that little guy we don't need to have his services today. Why don't you wait here just a second? Let's, 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 you know, I, I took a long time to put these together, so let's enjoy them. <laughs> I think I've used every cliche you can think of for Switzerland there, so go ahead, the next one. Okay, here's, here's the nice map here that shows the various cantons. Notice how many of them there are. Where did I put my little pointer here? This is Carl Brendan over the very far east here. And uh, the next one, not, not yet, but notice that the French is over here. Italian is down here and here and here. Uh, sorry, here and here. Romance is scattered throughout here, but everything else is German. Okay, the next slide, please. This gives you a better picture. All of this is French speaking, Italian speaking, and then here and here. This is all German, and then these are the pockets where Romans is. But notice the population density. It's really mainly up between these four cities of Zurich, Basel, Bern, and Vincennes. Of course, Lausanne and Geneva over here, Lugano and Locarno here. This is Kur, which is German speaking, and everything else is mountainous and less populated. Okay, next please. Uh, this is a bilingual sign in B, uh, B, uh, sorry, B -L -D -N. You rarely see the name of the city without both of the names associated with it. Next. Okay, this is typical of in Biel. Next. Here's a magazine rack. Notice that some things are in French, some of them are in German. These are mainly uh, headlines here. Next. Okay, here's a typical street name. Schmied, Schmiedengasse in German, but Rüde. Thank you. In French. All right, next. Now, this is the Bahnhof in uh, Biel, notice that everything, German and French. Generally, German has the first billing because it is slightly more German population. Next. Okay, this is in Friburg. This is typical of some signs you see there, but not everywhere. Next. Okay, here again is the distribution of languages, 63.7% German, 19.2 French, 7.6 Italian, a little slice for Romance, and then almost 9% other languages. Okay. Next. Okay, just one more clip. Switzerland was born on August 1st, 1291, when the three mountain cantons of Uri, Schwyz, and Unterwald made a pledge to unite in defense of their borders against the increasingly powerful, powerful Habsburgs. Click. In the 14th century, they were joined by Luzern, click, Zurich, click, Glarus, Zug, and Bern. In the 15th century, Freiburg, and I pronounce it German this time, because it was German when it came in, and Zolotun joined the Confederation. Next, followed in the 16th century by Basel, Schaffhausen, and Appenzell. One more. Okay, so this is the development then of Switzerland, beginning with three cantons. There are 26 today, and then slowly adding them over the centuries. Now, this is the way it actually remained for almost 300 years. It's important to keep in mind that up until 1798, just 203 years ago, Switzerland was a monolingual country. German was the language. There are speakers of other languages there, but German was the only official language. As an aftermath of the revolutionary spirit in Europe at this time, the Napoleonic Wars, and the Congress of Vienna in 1815, Switzerland once again began to grow. Frau Brinden, St. Gallen, Agau and Tugau, all German speaking, and then Ticino, which is Italian, and Wu, which is French. Next one. Followed by Valais, Neuchâtel, and Geneva in 1815. And this is the way it stayed up until just about 22 years ago when the canton of Jura was made from the canton of Ben. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. In 1848, a new constitution was introduced, and it had a more centralized government but also guaranteed a good deal of sovereignty to the 
individual cantons. By the way, it's important to also keep in mind that up until about uh, 1798, Switzerland was not really a country as we understand it today, but a confederation of independent cantons. It was only in 1848 when a central government was established and the Constitution was written. The federal government has a say in language issues only when it involves the military, the federal public service, or other government-related programs that go beyond the level of the canton. So, how does it all work? Is everybody happy? Before I respond to these questions, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about this fourth language, Romanche. We are well acquainted with French, German, and Italian, but the question is, what is Romanche? As the name suggests, it is a Romance language, as are French and Italian. It is a Reto-Romanic language and is related to Ladin, which is spoken in northern Italy. By the way, there are several ways of saying this language. There's Romanche, Romanish, Romanic. I just choose Romanche because that's what I see most, most commonly in the literature. There are several varieties of Romanche in Switzerland, each one clustering in one of the valleys of Graubünden. Each dialect has its own unique features, but they are generally mutually comprehensible. The speakers are descendants of Latin speakers who occupied these valleys long before the incursion of the Alemannic tribes in the third century. Even though Romanche is considered a national language in Switzerland, it is not an official language even in its own canton, but it has a quasi-official status. It is strongly subsidized by the federal and local governments and is therefore able to provide an education system for its children, transmit radio and television broadcasts, publish newspapers, and even a few books and magazines. Next slide here. This is a welcoming sign to the town of Surselva. Notice that the languages are German, English, and then Romanche in the middle. Next slide, please. And this is the other side of the town where it tells us Sin Silvesia, I guess, or Auf Wiedersehen, if you prefer that. Next one, please. This is a picture of a book that you've seen before in other languages. This is the Romanche version of it. Now, this says something because books are fairly expensive to publish. And with a readership of just a couple of hundred thousand people, you can imagine there had to be a lot of subsidization to be able to, first of all, translate this and then publish it. But it was important enough for the children of the Romanche speakers to be able to have something like this for them to read. Next, please. This is taken from a book that is supposed to be uh, a help for German speakers learning Romanche. And if you understand German, on the left over here, you can see what all these things say. Typical phrases that you might use if you're out among the people. Now, as it turns out, virtually every Romanche speaker knows German. So there's no real point in the Germans learning Romanche to be able to communicate. But as, as part of the spirit of multilingualism, they do this. I should also point out that Switzerland is very proud of the fact that there are four languages spoken there. And so they're very anxious to maintain this. Romanche was a dying language for quite a long time. In fact, people today still are talking about uh, its obituary. And yet, it's able to maintain itself fairly well over the years. Usually, however, if a Romanche mother marries a German-speaking father, the language of the children is German. And the other way around, if a Romanche father marries a German-speaking mother, the language of the children is German. It's just there's so much motivation to learn German to be able to survive economically, even in the canton of Graubünden, that they want to be able to learn German, and then often they uh, lose their Romanche through the generations. Uh, next one, please. I had this here because this is a picture of a, uh, a folder for the radio and television station. You can see Radio e Televisione Romancia. And if you click this, you won't be able to hear what I wanted you to hear. In fact, can you put the mouse on that and click it? If you're real quiet, you can just barely hear something. Can you find the mouse there? There. I was hoping to amplify this, but... It's hopeless. If you want to see me afterwards, you can hear some Romanche. It's from a Romanche a radio bro program. Uh, when my wife and I were there, they gave us a little CD that gives us information about Romanche. <laughs> the children in Romanche-speaking languages do not begin formal education in German until the fifth grade, but they are constantly exposed to it. Next slide, please. You've seen this one, but I just want to again point out that this is the Upper Rhine Valley here. This is the Inn Valley, which flows into Austria. And this is another valley over here. This is the Lower and Upper, I'm sorry, Upper and Lower Engadine. And uh, this dot you see over here, I think is, no, is that Zankmoritz? Zankmoritz is here. 
The area is best known for its skiing, and people come from all over Europe to go to St. Moritz, to Davos, to Klosters, and so forth. Uh, if you go to these places here where you see these dots, a lot of them are not even Romance speakers. They're German speakers. The Romance speakers tend to be in very small communities up in the hills, up in the mountains, and they come down to the larger communities, usually to do shopping and so forth. Back to the question of how multilingualism works in Switzerland. One can say that it works about as well as their clocks and their trains. Unlike other multilingual countries, there have been few serious issues relating from language differences. There are the typical feelings of contempt often directed toward the German-speaking Switzerland because of its size and economic dominance, and it would be wrong to claim that there are no problems. But given the complex circumstances, there's a surprising amount of cooperation and respect among the Swiss of different languages. An interesting survey of young men about to do their compulsory national service from the early 90s gives at least a glimpse about language attitudes in Switzerland. I don't have the information about numbers, but young men from the four language areas were asked if they found, would find language to be an obstacle if they were assigned to serve in one of the other three language areas. Can I have the slide, please? This is hard to understand, uh, partly because the colors didn't come out, I mean, the shades didn't come out right. But just as an example, the German speakers said that, well, 43% of them said they would find a major obstacle to serving in the French-speaking part of Switzerland, but 43.6% said they would not find it an obstacle, scarcely an obstacle. Uh, as far as the French speakers were concerned, uh, going to Italian-speaking Switzerland, 85 of them said that's no problem. Only 6.9% said, yeah, that might be kind of a problem to be there. So if we look at these numbers that are considered an obstacle, 43, 35, 7, and so forth, we see that the attitude among these young men is that they don't see a real big problem about going to one of the other areas of Switzerland and serving in the armed forces. Up to, <clears throat> up to now, we've been talking about mul uh, ah, national multilingualism, that is, the presence and use of more than one language in a country. What about individual multilingualism, that is, the ability of Swiss citizens to speak one or more of other national languages? The Swiss writer Peter Bixel spoke about this topic in a speech he gave several years ago. He said, and I'm translating this now, we Swiss are multilingual with a sense of pride. And then after a slight pause, but I Swiss am monolingual. And from a more recent document, I quote, Foreigners often assume that the fact that there are four national languages spoken in Switzerland means that every Swiss speaker speaks four languages, or at least three. However, the reality is very different. The Swiss can be proud of their linguistic proficiency, and many understand the other languages, the other language of their fellow countrymen very well. However, the proficiency in the national languages, and this is interesting, is decreasing in favor of English. Quadrilingual Switzerland is becoming a two-and-a-half language Switzerland. People speak their mother tongue and English and understand a second national language. It is part of the national school, uh, I'm sorry, part of the school education in all Swiss cantons to introduce one of the other national languages as a mandatory subject in the third grade. In German Switzerland, French is usually the language of choice. In French Switzerland, it is usually German or Italian. Italian speakers are divided between French and German, and Romance children learn German. In the fifth grade, a second foreign language is offered as an optional language, either a second national language or another language outside of Switzerland, for example, English or Spanish. In recent years, English has more and more become the language of choice. How effective is this training in the public schools of Switzerland? Well, it depends on how you evaluate it. According to the literature, fewer than half of Swiss adults claim to be proficient in any other second national language. In fact, except for Romance speakers and those who are, whose occupation requires them to use a second language, most Swiss rarely have or even seek the opportunity to use a national language other than their own. Many of them can understand one of the other languages, but most of them would not hold up well in a conversation. Last summer, my wife and I spent a week in the non-German parts of Switzerland. We began in Jura, went to Neuchâtel, then to Fribourg and Vaux, finally Valais, and then to Chino. I will be the first to admit this was not a rigorous scientific study. But, based on what I'd already read, I wanted to verify some of the claims. I simply spoke to people in German to see what the response would be. Our first stop was a McDonald's in the city of Delamont in Jura. 
I noticed that all the newspapers there for people to read were only in French. I said to the two young girls behind the counter, Guten Tag, verstehen Sie Deutsch? I'm convinced that the correct answer to this question should have been, yeah. They understood me perfectly well. But in order to avoid the possible situation of having to speak German, they made the usual gestures, shrugged shoulders, and responded in French. The next stop was the pharmacy, where an older woman spoke a little German with me, but not very well. The woman at the tourist office spoke very well, but with a strong accent. We had the good fortune to meet an elderly man whose mother was Swiss German, and he took a liking to us and gave us a personal tour of the city, all in German. When I explained to him my interest in multilingualism, he said that in the Jura, the older people speak better German than the younger ones because it was once a part of the canton of Ben. He said, one doesn't hear much German in Delamont, or in the Jura, for that matter. In Neuchâtel that evening, we found there was no evidence of German on signs, menus, and so forth. The woman in the hotel, in fact, preferred to speak to us in English. And so it was in Lausanne, Montreux, and Sion. The situation was somewhat different in Lugano, one of the two large Italian-speaking cities in Ticino. Besides speaking with people on the street, I spent some time in a department store going from department to department and asking in German where I could find menchus, electronics, the cafeteria, and so forth. The results were mixed. Older people generally were more proficient than younger people. Some could not speak at all. But, again, as you walk around the city of Lugano, one has a definite feeling that one's an Italian city, not a bilingual city. We also spent a couple of days trying to find Romance speakers and had a, had a little success, I'm sorry, a little success in the town of Ilans in the Upper Rhine Valley. Most Romance speakers live in small communities but interact with Germans regularly. We spoke with young children about 12 to 13 years old. Their German was good, but it was obviously a struggle for them to speak it. They said that they use only German, use German only in school and then communicating with German speakers in Ilans. We talked to an older man who lived in the mountains and came to Ilans each Saturday to shop and do other chores. His German was quite weak, and he said he rarely speaks German. You might be thinking correctly that I neglected to study how well this uh, German Swiss speak French and Italian. Guilty, but according to literature, this situation is only slightly different. In several studies, one reads that in a conversation between a German Swiss and a French Swiss, Swiss, French is generally the language that's used. No explanation given. A final matter must be mentioned. We think of French, German, and Italian and associate them with the languages spoken in the countries that carry a similar name. The most commonly spoken language in Switzerland, however, is not German, but Schweizerdeutsch, a dialect or a set of dialects, which is used by virtually all German Swiss most of the time. Indeed, Swiss, German, Swiss Germans learn standard German as a second language in the school, usually beginning about age six. Many adults are uncomfortable about speaking standard German, and some of them rarely have occasion to. I was talking to a young woman from Kuh yesterday, a, a Swiss German, basically, and it's obvious that uh, her German is not the same as it's here from Berlin or Frankfurt. And I asked her, is it a chore for you to speak standard German? And she smiled and said, yes, it is, because at home I rarely use it. Only it's, in, it's only in church, and if she has uh, things to do with, with people from Germany or other German-speaking countries. Let's see. This next slide. I'm sorry, this next slide here. If you look at this, it's interesting that we have the domains down here and dialect versus standard. This is for Swiss German. Almost everything is done in the dialect. And as far as the standard language is concerned, it's only in school or at the university and then only part of the time. Most of the time, from a day-to-day -day basis, they just use their dialect to speak. Now, what does this mean as far as linguistic equilibrium is concerned? Think of the French and Italian-speaking children learning German in school. They learn standard German, not Swiss German. Let's assume that a young woman from Lausanne has developed a good proficiency in German and wants to do an internship in a bank in Zurich. She may perform well in her official duties, but what happens if she wants to join her German-speaking colleagues for lunch or attend a social gathering in the evening? They will speak to her out of politeness in standard German, but to each other in Swiss German. She'll have difficulty integrating socially until she's able to speak and understand the colloquial language of Swiss German. I mentioned earlier there have been few serious language-related situations that threaten stability in Switzerland. Let me mention briefly three. The first was in the early years of the 20th century during the so-called pan-German movement in Europe that was evolving under Bismarck. 
There was extensive penetration of German ideas and personnel into the Swiss universities, intellectual life, commerce, and industry. Even the tourist trade and army were affected. All of this reflected the new German nationalism. With the German violation of Belgian neutrality in 1914, a deep rift opened between the French and German Swiss. But a crisis was avoided, and as the First World War began, the pan-German movement abated in Switzerland. The second incident was shortly after the Second World War. In 1947, the Bern Parliament, the canton of Bern, was asked to ratify the choice of Georges Mucli, pardon my French, a French speaker who, to head the cantonal department of public works and railroads. A German-speaking deputy arose and moved to reject the appointment on the grounds that this department was too important to have a francophone be its head. The motion was carried. Indignation ensued, and a struggle began, which ended 32 years later with the new French-speaking canton of Jura. The third incident took place last year. The head of the education board in the canton of, Switzer, uh, of, of Zurich announced that beginning in the year 2003, school children in the third grade will have the choice of learning either English or another national language as their first language. The response from the French was predictable. The debate is still raging today, and in fact is being debated in the national parliament. Now this has overtones for other things as well, because if the national government gets involved in telling a canton what it can and cannot do with language, that would be the first time they've violated this neutrality. It's important to realize that there are other divisions in Switzerland besides language, and some run even deeper. Politics, religion, demographic structure, geographical terrain, and distribution of income. None of these coincide with linguistic boundaries. It's impossible in 35 minutes to give more than a mere glimpse of the linguistic situation in Switzerland. It's interesting, admirable, even changing from day to day, and in some ways, perhaps, a model for other countries. Thank you. We have time for about five minutes of questions from the audience, if any of you would like to ask <laughs> Professor Jones. Let's see, right back here first. Uh-huh. I don't know the details, but you may realize that at that time there was a lot of changing of borders and there was a lot of independence of small territories that hadn't aligned yet with larger countries. And so this fluidity gave rise to territories having a choice of being part of this entity or this entity. And so for whatever reason, these French-speaking countries ended up in Switzerland and the Ticino area ended up as part of Switzerland as well. Question here. That's a very good question. I, I don't know, because they are a very strong country, and I think that perhaps their independence is part of their strength. But uh, they were not occupied during the Second World War by Nazi Germany. Uh, up until recently, they have not had a lot of foreigners living in the country, at least for long periods of time. But that's kind of slowly changing now, and I'm not sure what's going to come of, of that. Question over here, yes. Actually, I was going to answer the question. Oh, please do, yes. Okay, but not officially, though. Yeah, they've been calling it the Turkish Identity, and then they just have to take it back again to see what the status of that Yes, the independence of, of, uh, of the country as a whole came in the 19th century, actually. So it, it solidified, you might say, in these, as you call them, colonies, and became officially part of the Confederation. Royal? Uh, the 9%. Oh, there is. I didn't bother to look at it, but uh, a lot of it's English. Uh, a lot of it is um, Albanian. Uh, a lot of the uh, Eastern and Southern European countries, people coming there for economic reasons to, to work there. Some Spanish, kind of a, yeah, Portuguese, kind of a, a combination of a lot of the European countries, especially that are economically a little less well off than the other Western European countries. Other questions? Yes, surely. It's uh, Protestant, uh, Protestant and Catholic. French is pretty much all Catholic. Uh, German is split between the two. Uh, Ticino is Catholic. Uh, I think in Graubünden it's Protestant. I'm not really sure. But there are also Protestant sections of, of uh, French-speaking Switzerland as well. So as I say, the, the linguistic boundaries and religious boundaries don't coincide. So that's another thing to, to give rise to disagreement. Yes? Is that German uh, dialect? Is it Alamanche? 
What's that? Alamanish. Oh, yes, it's Alamanish. That's right, yes. Uh, it's high Alamanish, as a matter of fact. Well, Baden-Württemberg is, is considered low Alamanish, not from a, a cultural standpoint, but just the historical development of it. Yeah. Swiss, Swiss German is, is definitely high Alamanic. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you for getting the, the hardware working. I guess we had one more here. I'm sorry. I don't, and I apologize. I, I, make, I realize it makes this survey I did kind of one-sided, but uh, I just wanted to see what I could learn and discover by going to those places and talking to them in German to see what the response would be. Okay, thanks for the technology support there and the fact we got that working.